imagine a transcriptome analytic tool that can predict responsive therapy from a single circulating tumor cell. That's precisely what we're trying to accomplish with our method, the analysis of aggregated cell-to-cell -cell distances. Here I'm going to be talking about our, our proceedings paper. I'm just going to highlight the main ideas and the methods from the paper, and uh, I invite you to, to check out the paper for more details. Our group, the Lucier group, we specialize in translational medicine. So we focus on translating clinical and genomic big data to clinical practice and research. So that's going to be the aim of the primary aim of this methodology. Let's take a step back and look at the big picture. Bulk RNA-seq offers a look at average gene expression across a tens of, of thousands of cells. And this can give us a look at interpatient variation and answer questions that address those type of settings. On the other hand, single cell RNA-seq offers an unprecedented look at individual cellular expression and can address questions such as intratumoral heterogeneity or intrapatient heterogeneity. And with that in mind, let's think about what methods are available to study these type of data. Methods so far focus mostly on basic science. They want to identify subpopulations of cells or transcriptional kinetics. And these fine methods that I've listed here do a very good purpose of that but have trouble in the settings where you're looking at rare cells, such as circulating tumor cells, where you may obtain only one or two from a blood sample from patients. Our, our approach, the analysis of cell-to-cell -cell pathway distances, focuses on pairwise statistics of differentially expressed pathways. And differentially expressed pathways as an analog to differ differentially expressed genes is the core idea behind this framework. We have paired statistics, but then we aggregate and, and take a look at from different viewpoints. We borrow a method from our single subject studies, the N of one pathway is myelinobus distance, as to compute these pairwise statistics of DEPs, differentially expressed pathways. Quick outline of the talk. I'm going to walk through the construction of these pairwise statistics of DEPs. I'll talk about how we an analyze the aggregation of these. And then I'll apply this to the CTC data that I've been talking about. And to make things concrete, instead of just doing all the methods and then the results, I'll talk about a method and then give a result as we go through. And you can take a look at these aggregation of pairs from three different perspectives, cross-group, within-group, and cell-centric statistics. And the cell-centric statistics is what I alluded to in the introduction about predicting responsive therapy from a single circulating tumor cell. And finally, I'll leave you with a take-home message to make these ideas memorable. First, the construction of DEPs. Uh, just a reminder, we, we have a patient, we are sequencing one cell at a time, and you could apply this and say circulating tumor cells. Then we pair the cells either between patient or within patient, and take a look at the whole transcriptomes compared to the, for that pair of cells. We use curated knowledge bases to uh, filter down to gene sets of interest, pathways that are curated to some biological function. And from this, we can look at the bivariate expression in between these two cells, with the x-axis representing the log expression of the cell on the, um, for the baseline cell, and the y representing the log expression of the reference cell, the cell of comparison. You can see that in the log scale, this is roughly linear in shape. And if you have the uh, equal expression in the two cells transcriptomes within a pathway, then this line of uh, diagonal line here represents that, that null response or equal expression. Each point is here is the two measurements for, for a single gene out of the two conditions. And you can, you can think about this distance to the line as just a log fold change, and it has a sign. If it's below the diagonal line, it's negative, so lower in the second cell. If it's above, it's positive. Now, importantly, we know that single-cell RNA-seq is inherently more noisy than bulk RNA-seq. So we chose to use the Malinobis distance, which is a statistical genera uh, generalization of the Euclidean distance, which accounts for the variance covariance structure here uh, um, between the, the two cells within the pathway. Averaging all these vertical distances within the pathway, you get an overall metric of differential pathway expression, which we call the MD score, or D bar represented here. And this is our me measure of effect size. And you can think about it as an adjusted pathway level full change. Further, we construct a hypothesis test if the expected value of this MD score is different from zero, 
and this can quantify the uncertainty of whether or not this pathway has strong evidence of being differentially expressed. So you get two statistics here with each pair of cells. You get an effect size and a p-value. Let's talk about how we can aggregate these pairs. The cross-group pairs in the two-group setting, so you have two phenotypes, and you can look at all the pairs between the two phenotypes, allow us to make, uh, ask questions about phenotypic differences between the two phenotypes. Moreover, we can explore pairs within a phenotype to talk about which pathways are most consistently expressed. And lastly, again, pointing back to predictions that from a single cell, we can make cell-centric specifics of dynamics, and we can, we can look at a phenotype, a uh, cell from a certain phenotype, and then look at all the pairs against many, many different reference cells to, to take a look at the differential expressed pathways for a single cell. The case study that we're going to apply throughout is a pioneering data set that offers a look at single cell RNA sequencing data from circulating tumor cells from prostate cancer patients. Thirteen blood draws uh, were, were obtained and then the uh, CTCs were isolated and sequenced. And uh, importantly, that we had also a clinical outcome here. The thirteen patients, of the thirteen patients, eight were naive to an antiantrogen drug and five were resistant. Now, this is very valuable from a translational perspective that we can study this type of data set. The naive patients, it's important to note, they're not sensitive. We, we just don't know if they're sensitive or resistant. So thereby, the, the phenotype's a little different, not sensitive and resistant. It is just naive and resistant. So we can try and make predictions about a propensity to resist the treatment. The knowledge base we, we used was the Pathway Interaction Database. It's a, it's a uh, database that is mostly signaling pathways and, and often implicated in cancer. After some filtering, we have 187 pathways of interest. So that's our data. Taking a look at the cross-group pairs between phenotype A and phenotype B in the general setting, we, we can make statements about whether or not a certain pathway is differentially expressed across the two phenotypes. Often the circulating tumor cell data is, is nested in nature. So as I pointed out, you have a patient and then several circulating tumor cells are sequenced from that patient. So the construction of this p-value, we actually use a bootstrapping procedure that bootstrap the patients instead of the cells and thereby avoiding super rep, uh, replication mistakes. And for each one of these 187 pathways, we can compute a p-value saying whether or not it's differentially expressed between the two phenotypes. Taking a look at those results, you've, we, we've got four different methods we're comparing. We've got the cross group, this is our proposed method, versus weighted least squares, which is a traditional uh, statistical approach that we applied, and then GSEA, and then single cell differential expression plus enrichment. And what you'll note here is a striking similarity between cross group p-values and WLS. Uh, you can see that there's a peak near zero, indicating they're finding some signal between these two groups. And uh, importantly, they concord very well with the top ranked hits. GSEA and DEG plus enrichment did not concord well with any of the methods and have a relatively flat and uninformative p-value distribution. Next, take a look at the top five hits that were retained by the cross-group p-values. You'll see on the x-axis the MD score across all of these pairs. I'll note, between these two phenotypes, there's 1,500 pairs that we're exploring. And so there's a distribution of the MD scores. All of the MD scores central tendency was to be greater than zero, showing overexpression of these five, five pathways. Non-canonical WINT was the main pathway that was implicated in the paper that generated the data, and S1P1, FOXM1, and ERB are all known anti-antigen resistant mechanisms. Most novel we found was the SDC4 pathway, which is actually downstream to the non-canonical WINT pathway. We're going to explore these five resistance associated pathways uh, with our downstream analysis from the other perspectives of these pairings. So the second analysis looks at the within group pairs. Within a phenotype, you can look at all the different pairs. Note that in the cross group, we had a signed metric saying a, the resistant compared to naive uh, comparisons. Here, the, the direction is arbitrary. So what we're really trying to understand is the abundance of differentially expressed pathways uh, not as much the direction of it, because the direction is arbitrary. So note in this toy example, phenotype A is more differentially expressed, showing that that, that phenotype may not be as important for manifesting, manifesting that phenotype, that pathway. <clears throat> note, 
that uh, if we look at the five resistance associated pathways and look at the percentage of DEPs for these CTC pairs within group, that the resistant cells were much more consistently expressed in these pathways, especially the SEC4, which was very tightly regula regulated. So the cross group helped us identify these pathways and the within group help us talk about a different perspective about what, what pathways are most consistently expressed. Next, I'll take a look at those cell-centric statistics that I alluded to and that what I believe is the most exciting part of this method. And you can compare a phenotype against many, many different references that has a distribution of MD scores for a certain pathway. And you can you could summarize this simply as taking the median value if you want to kind of look at an overall trend here. And that actually concords to a particular pair uh, between a certain cell in the first phenotype and the second phenotype. And that has the associated pairwise statistics, the effect size, and the p-value associated with it. So now, let's take a look at the uh, application to the CTC data. This is a pretty complicated data slide. I'll, I'll walk you through it. On the uh, panel A here, we've got 13 patients that were sequenced, their CTCs were sequenced. The eight naive patients are on the left and the five resistant patients on the right. As I pointed out in the um, uh, cell-centric statistics, a pathway can either be up, down, or not significantly different when comparing the two phenotypes, naive and resistant. So that's the color coding here, the down being the orange and the blue being the up. And then the count of CTCs are on the y-axis, and this varies from 1 to 12 for a patient, as you can tell. So for patient 3, we only have a single CTC that was explored. Now, in the, each of these five resistance-associated pathways, we can make predictions for a propensity to, res to resist the treatment. Patient 3 looks like a, a, a good candidate for sensitivity to the treatment as four of the five pathways are underexpressed. However, patient 9 shows much more intratumoral heterogeneity with many pathways over, overexpressed even above the resistant phenotype uh, with perhaps showing a propensity to resist treatment. Moreover, we produce novel visualizations called rose plots. So they're borrowed from wind rose plots from uh, the, the early um, uh, 18th century. And each of these petals represent the differential expression between the two phenotypes for that single cell. Here, the zones represent the amount of statistical significance. Statistical significance and further, you can, you can quickly and readily identify this cell as being under, as under expressing those four out of those five pathways. One pathway is overexpressed, but not significantly so. So the idea, again, is, is for clinical value for a physician to make a quick decision based on this rose plot. In a resistant CTC, four out of the five pathways are overexpressed, as indicated by the blue uh, pathways labeled. So I'll leave you with a take home message. To, to help remember what these methods are for and, and when they're useful. The aggregated cell-to-cell -cell distances are useful when you have a small number of cells where many, many other single cells, RNA sequencing cells are not useful. You, they, we compute differentially expressed pathway tests, but not differentially expressed gene tests. We make no claims at the gene level. And we can, we can drill down to an individual cell for st statistics and visualizations at that level of granularity. These other methods are designed for different purposes and uh, do not um, do not concord exactly with what we're trying to accomplish here. I'd like to uh, acknowledge my funding, uh, University of Arizona, NIH, and especially ISCV for their generous travel fund so I could be with you, with you today. I'd like to uh, uh, acknowledge my group, the Lucier group, my mentor, Dr. Eve Lucier, uh, the rest of our hardworking uh, group that, and, that I'm so uh, honored to be representing here today, many of them in this, in this room with me and my statistical advisor, Dr. Walter P. Gorsh, and our collaborators that helped on this project. And finally, uh, please follow us on Twitter and, and check out our hashtags. Uh, and um, uh, I'd like to leave you with this final note. We're working towards precision medicine. We wanna take a pair of cells, look at the, um, the differentially expressed pathways between these cells. We can visualize them for clinical translation. We can aggregate them at the patient level to make treatment decisions. And uh, with that in mind, I will open it up for questions.